Good morning. It's Tuesday, August 12th, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 41. And my name is Chris, and we're back after we missed today because uh, I had a little bit of a stomach bug, and I apologize for that. But never fear. The news is here still, and we have, as always, a great team on our Mumble Room. Good, or, I'm sorry, time-appropriate greetings, Mumble citizens. Good, Good, morning. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning over the USA. Yes, yeah, so. yeah, celebrate that good morning. Uh, okay, so I want to start with a story today that is I'm I was awestruck by this over the weekend and it is so it is so fascinating how uh, we react to some stories and then the exact same type of story comes out and there's a totally different reaction and sometimes I just sit back and I don't understand the humans. So let's start with our story. Uh, Yaomi, I think is how you say it. It's X I A O M I. These are the big phone makers in China. Uh, and uh, legitimately, if you look into them, they're big because they rip Apple off wholesale. They rip off their icons, their style, their marketing. Their CEO even wears a black turtleneck and blue jeans when he goes up on stage. And I kid you not, at the end of his presentation, has one more thing to announce. And they put up a one more. I mean, these guys wholesale rip Apple off, including they have a functionality called the MyCloud. M-I-Cloud. Not iCloud. The MyCloud. So these guys have been blowing up because they've got an incredible range of devices and prices, and they have a very strong brand presence in China. And these, Xiaomi, is one of the reasons that Samsung's been getting their butt handed to them recently. Well, F-Secure decided to take a little look at the security of one of these Xiaomi phones, and uh, they discovered even when you didn't have MyCloud activated or turned on, in fact, if you just simply inserted a SIM card and connected the phone to Wi-Fi or turned on GPS, or maybe you added a contact, or even made a call or a text message, all of this was being sent back to the MyCloud servers. When they connected and logged into the MyCloud, the iCloud-like servers from Xiaomi, then they were they repeated the same tests as before. This time, the details were sent to a different server, api.account.xiaomi.com, as well as the phone's IME number and other secure details. Now, oh, wow, okay, this seems pretty bad, right? Oh, all right, so I'm sure they're going to come out with a strong response to this. Well, one of the folks that works for Xiaomi is one of Google's old head Android guys. In fact, he was the guy that would go up on stage during the Google I.O. keynotes and give, like, the really good keynotes. You guys might remember him. His name was Hugo, and uh, Hugo was really one of their best presenters. He now works for Xiaomi as uh, one of their head uh, guys. He's one of their head guys over there. And he came out and said, look, uh, this is not a big deal. This is not something we really need to be that worried about. Here, here, here's, here's, here's what we're going to do. We'll make it optional. You can opt into these services. Now, they'll be turned on, but you'll go right in there and you can turn them off. He, said, he went on to say the concerns that refer to the cloud messaging service described in the F-Secure article, um, they believe it's their top priority to protect user data and privacy, of course. And so what they're going to do is they're only going to hold on to this data for as long as they need to. You know, I mean, we're still going to hold on to it, they say, but just as long as we need to be able to make sure that someone can intercept it and we can help make sure all the calls and messages go through. So as of August 10th, which was uh, just two days ago, they've sent out an upgrade to all of their phones. After the upgrade, new users can do a factory reset or they can go into settings, my cloud, and cloud messaging from their home screen and turn it off. That will actually stop sending some of this data. Uh, but it's pretty interesting. And, and now it's kind of done. You probably haven't heard a lot of upset about this. There hasn't been a lot of controversy. They came out. They said, okay, yeah, well, well, well yes, it does do these things, uh, but we'll make a toggle setting for you. Now, if this was an American phone manufacturer, I think we would be freaking out about the NSA. It'd be all over the news. There'd be a Snowden leak to go with it. Glenn Greenwald would be tweeting. Eric. There'd be patent suits. Why is it that when it's when it's the Chinese phone manufacturer, we just go, yeah, oh, yeah, the of NSA course. The NSA sue with patent suits. Yeah, I can see that happening. It's China, right? Of course they're spying on it. Oh, yeah, no big deal. Of course. Why do? We, is that what's going to happen in the U.S. eventually once it just becomes... Oh, of course, it's just accepted. Yeah, the government, they're spying. Yeah, no big deal. Why is it, Eric? Why, do, why, don't we re why are we not reacting that strongly when it's a Chinese manufacturer? But if this was an American company, we'd be losing our S. Probably because in if it were an American manufacturer, the NSA would be more likely to have had say during the manufacturing process, whereas with a Chinese manufacturer, they have pretty much no say. Well, no, we don't, but the Chinese government does, and that's my point. It's like, uh, 
So look at all of these companies uh, that uh, are trying to sell into the Chinese markets right now, and China's putting the screw on them. We've talked a lot about Microsoft and Cisco and IBM and Apple, but what, it's happening across the board. It's happening to car manufacturing, all of it because of NSA meddling, they say, uh, or it's inferred. Here we go, straight up, an Android device sending all this data off to the servers, and we're all just fine with that. I don't know. I, what I'm trying to get to is it is it because it's China and it's, we're just too re- far removed from it, or or what I'm a little more worried about is that it's just um, we're reaching a point of saturation, of, of apathy towards this problem. That's that's my concern. And so I just want everyone to just consider that and and wonder if we need to stay vigilant. Uh, our next... I think, oh, go I ahead. think it's oh. probably the former. I think it's probably the former, like you were talking about. It's because it's China. It's far removed I hope from so. us. These devices aren't common in the U.S. So maybe that's why. I, th- I think it's also a case of that we kind of expect this to happen in China. That's what I was China's wondering too. Yeah. Not democracy either. Right. But that being said, okay, I mean, it does seem to be like they got their playbook from the NSA anyway. So you know, if they're going to do it this way, okay, right, you might as well do it okay wholesale with carriers and everyone else making these forward phones. So. Good point. Good point. Somebody else is making phone is Amazon, and uh, this is an interesting story. We're going to talk about the details really quick, and the thing that I find interesting about it is how little I care. How little I care, but you probably have heard about it. Amazon wants you to email Hatchet CEO and demand lower ebook prices. Amazon is going full hog. It's war mode now. I've gotten emails from book authors who are all upset and want me to go on the air and rant against Amazon. Then you've got consumers on the other side that want lower ebook prices. So uh, we, you, you probably recall that Amazon discontinued pre-orders for some of Hatchet's most popular books, which Hatchet's one of the largest publishers out there. Now Amazon, also same tactics, is canceling all pre-orders of Disney DVDs and Blu-rays and movies and whatnot, which includes things like Captain America, The Winter Soldier. Hello. Hello. So this is Amazon. This is Amazon playing the heavy. They got the market share now. They want to sell things at a certain price. Here's what you need to know about Amazon. They're not your friend. And neither is Disney, and neither is Hatchet. None of these people are your friend. You know why you like Amazon? For the same reason I like Amazon. And for the same reason they have lost money their entire existence. They are buying you. They're buying your trust. They're buying your favor. And that's not just a supposition. That's literally from the mouths of Jeff Bezos. What they do is they intentionally set the prices at an impractically low price. Either that's through the shipping or the price they actually sell on the Amazon store. But it's psychologically been proven via studies that when a company sells you something at an incredibly low price like that, your monkey reaction is to create a trust relationship with that seller. That's that's the brain science of it. That's why Amazon does what they do. That's why Amazon loses money. That's why they're backed by investors to help cover those gaps because that's the psychology. Is you build up the trust, you build up the market presence, you 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 dominate the market, you become the Walmart of the internet, and then you use that significant position to play hardball with some of these entrenched also very large companies. But we do need to keep in mind that it's really about that. Neither of these guys, Hachette, Amazon, Disney, are in it for us. They want to do it for their own interest, and they're more than willing to try to make you believe that what they do for their benefit is, in fact, for your benefits. Amazon, in my, fee- in my belief, is particularly egregious of doing this, and I'll tell you why here in a second. It's not about readers or authors, but anybody. It- Amazon wants ebooks capped at $9.99, so that way it can sell Kindles. It should stop pretending that it's about anything other than that. Instead, what they've done is they've doubled down on this, help us fight. And they've written a message that they've posted, an important message from the Kindle team. And they start with a, with a paragraph that is unbelievable. Just ahead of World War II, there was a radical invention that shook the foundations of book publishing. It was the paperback book. This was a time when movie tickets cost 10 to 20 cents and books were $2.50. The paperback cost only 25 cents. It was 10 times cheaper. Readers loved the paperback and millions of copies were sold in just the first year. You're like, oh, right. I get it. Ebooks are just like the paperback. Oh, thanks, Amazon. And then they go on. This is the part I love. They go on and they, they quote George Orwell. And they quote George Orwell. Where they, see, what they're trying to do is build a narrative that the publishers hated paperbacks because they thought it would destroy the industry when paperbacks brought sales up so much that, of course, it saved the industry. But they're trying to paint a picture here that they're having the same reactionary... 
oh, hello there. They're, they're having the same kind of reaction to paperbacks that they're, they're, they're now having to ebooks, which is... It's, the reason why that's not an apt comparison is because it wasn't controlled by one company selling the most popular way to read that and setting those prices, right? It was a market system. So what they do, though, is they, they quote George Orwell, you know, the author of 1984, and he says, if publishers had any sense, they would combine against them and suppress the paperback. And then Amazon goes on to say, yes, that was George Orwell suggesting that the publishers should, should collude. That quote where George Orwell says, if publishers had any sense, they would combine against them and suppress them. That was George Orwell joking. He was telling a joke. He was, what they are quoting, he is saying the exact opposite of what they are quoting. They have quoted him out of context to build this entire case that, oh, help us fight the good fight. The publishers are evil. It's not about that. This is where, even though I want cheap book prices, and I love the idea of not having to spend a bunch of money to read something. When I see the way Amazon is manipulating the public like this, I have to start to believe that they are being the more disingenuous here. And the emails I've gotten from book authors would seem to back that up from their perspective. And so we really, we really have to be careful because we, we are trying to be played by these companies and they're trying to now do it in the public. They're trying to do it through PR and press releases and, and you know, large posts on their website that say, a message from the Amazon Books team, an important Kindle update. Really? You know, there's nothing new under the sun. All advertising, all marketing is psychology at its root. So when I see stuff like this, I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is just... This is exactly the same thing that happened back when they hi- they artificially hiked the price of diamonds mm-hmm. because diamonds do are not supposed do not cost as much. They are not as rare as their price would suggest. Right. Uh, diamonds were artifi- The price was artificially hiked by the jeweler industry to target people making getting engagement rings. It's especially. a it's a luxury item, so they're going to gouge you for it. Exactly. So I, the thing is, what I'm seeing is, you know, even the word halitosis. Halitosis is not a medical condition. It was made up uh, by uh, the mouthwash industry. But anyways, what I'm seeing is they're basically just using bits and pieces to try to get their way and to try to show that they are on the side of the consumer. Right. When really... If you look at every single for-profit industry that exists, it's all about the money. It all comes down to the money and the bean counting. That's and all it comes down to. The other thing I find to be fascinating about this is this has we have been building to this point where they are doing this this essentially they're at war now. They are at all sides are calling each other's names, they're doing financial they're uh, they're doing economic trickery to each other. And it all started when there was the Amazon versus Apple for the price fixing collusion that Steve Jobs got in on when when Apple launched the iBook store and what the change that Apple wanted to make is they wanted to allow publishers to set their own price that's fundamentally what the whole dispute came down to is that Amazon wants uh, Amazon has this policy that says if you're going to publish in here and publish somewhere else you need to set them the same price so essentially if you want to be in the Kindle store and you ha- then you have to have a $9.99 book that meant if you're going to go in the iBook store or the Barnes and Noble bookstore you had to be 9.99 you couldn't charge 13.99 or 7.99 right uh, so this ended up in the in them going to court because, of course, they found emails where Steve Jobs was very openly colluding with the book publishers to set up where they would set the price, which is obviously what they want. They want to be able to set the price. And because Amazon won that battle, that gave them the power to move forward now and say, all right, well, as of right now, we remain the, we are we are the we are the 10,000 pound gorilla and we can now push you around. This has been in motion since that court case. And, uh, well, if you look at that court case, it was pretty much just like, you know, here's what's really going on, and what we're going to do is do the same thing, but not nearly as publicly. And I wonder if I wonder what the deadline is for this. Is the deadline to have this crap figured out, like the holiday season, buying season? Is that like, because I don't feel like this is going to go on for much longer because there's just too much money being left behind. But essentially, Amazon's at the point now where they're the size where they can just hang tight and be like, okay, well... We can afford not to have you on here for a few days. We're still going to make a ton of money. And Hachette, not necessarily in the same position. Amazon's kind of 
one of the number one outlets for books and ebooks. So you kind of have to be there. I'm trying to figure out would would the ebook industry really be affected by the holiday industry that much? Because yeah, that's one of those things you can buy just yeah. constantly well, throughout the, the year. If you're gonna give something, definitely, definitely the readers and stuff care. They yeah. are, you know, yeah. uh, Christmas gifts, aren't they? So right. And you don't want to. Yeah. You don't want to. Also, you don't want to be the company selling the e-reader that doesn't have Hachette Books because they're like the number four or five publisher in the U.S. So yeah, that that would be a bad idea. Hey, uh, speaking of all about being in the right place at the right time, check out how this hacker stole tons and tons and tons of bitcoins by using a pretty clever BGP hack that kind of makes me wonder if A, this isn't already happening all the time by state actors, and B, why we haven't seen more of this. So re- researchers at Dell SecureWorks, and I'm thinking this was Popey, you guys. I'm just going to put, I'm, well, I don't have any proof, but I'm thinking this was Popey. Uh, security, the researchers at Dell Works Security Division say they've uncovered a series of incidents in which Bitcoin thief redirected a portion of online traffic from no less than 19 ISPs, including data from networks of Amazon and hosting services like DigitalOcean, OVH, and the goal with the goal of stealing cryptocurrencies from different groups of Bitcoin users. Uh, And here's the great part. Each redirection just lasted 30 seconds or so. The thief was able to perform the attack 22 times, each time hijacking and gaining control of the processing power of a group of Bitcoin miners. The user who, you know, then users, so users go into these pools and they all work together collectively with their processing power. He would redirect the output from that pool. The attacker would specifically go after these pools. The redirection technique tricked the pool's participants into continuing to devote their processors to Bitcoin mining while allowing the hacker to keep the proceeds. At its peak, according to the researchers' measurements, the hacker scam was pocketing a flow of Bitcoins and other digital currencies, including Doge, up to $9,000 a day. So here's how he did it. According to Dell researchers, he used a little BGP hijacking which exploits the uh, border gateway protocol. We've talked about BGP hijacking hijacking on TechSnap before. The routing instructions of BGP tell, like, different routers the, 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 the best route to take. And if you can trick these, they'll start sending traffic to different locations. So he got, he took advantage of a staff user account at a Canadian internet service provider to periodically broadcast spoofed commands that redirected traffic from other ISPs. It's essentially a trust system. Uh, so this is starting in February. He ran it through May of this year. The BGP Bitcoin stealing exploits represent a less of a new vulnerability in Bitcoin, more actually of a vulnerability in the fragility of the Internet itself. Uh, if one Canadian ISP can be used to redirect a large flow of Internet traffic, uh, that's not really a Bitcoin problem. That's more of an Internet problem. So it makes you wonder perhaps how other types of Internet data could be stolen in this methodology. Dell researchers suggested the companies set up monitoring through services like BGBmon, which can detect if BGP hijacking has occurred. Isn't that funny? Just go into one Canadian ISP, and yeah, you can get... Kinda, that's kind of creepy, Pays. Yeah, it is. One ISP, and you get Amazon's traffic, DigitalOcean, OVH, these mining pools. we got to get BGP wow. squared away. And there is ways to make BGP more secure. Yeah, we, we, need, to, we need to start rethinking about how to do this properly, then. Yeah. <laughs> BGP is obviously a weak point here if you... I, uh, the one yeah. sort of... One sort of, you know, into the system, which can reprogram other ones. So <laughs> I, I yeah, agree. I agree. Days. I think, uh, you know, I had uh, I had a network that had a BGP uh, uh, set up on it that went really wonky on us one time. And it just even just that caused a lot of chaos. And so, it, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a security thing. It just be bad implementation sometime. Um, last story of the day submitted by Clement L. in the techtalktoday.reddit.com subreddit. Dutch government funds a safe Dropbox alternative. Hey, oh, it's called Localbox. Love the name, too. Uh, he says uh, you can, he's, he's in the subreddit, and I've linked to this in the show notes. Got a link to the show page where you can download the server. It's written with PHP and Symphony. Here's the downside only clients for Windows and Android and iOS at the moment, but they're planning to release the, force, the full source code this fall, so I'm sure we'll see packages for Linux and Mac soon. So it's called Localbox, and it's some, something the Dutch government's working on. And uh, assuming they put this under a license that uh, I think everybody's happy with, this could be an awesome alternative. Not that Sync Thing and BitTorrent Sync aren't good, uh, but I love the idea of an established organization behind the effort, just so that way, if this is something that's moving your files around that you become dependent on, it's really nice to know that there's some sort of bureaucracy behind it, in a sense, to keep it alive, to keep it going, to keep it funded, hopefully. So, local box. We'll keep an eye out on this, and uh, we'll cover it on future shows if there's anything 
of interest that develops. I'd just be worried that the Dutch government has the ability to see what's there, whatever's in there. Yeah, I got to make sure the source code is available and in a license that people could make their own builds and verify them and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be really critical for this to be successful. But it sounds like, since they're talking about it being open from the get-go, they're talking about the source code release. It sounds like they get that. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, they have it available right now. And then when you download it, it's just the binary, it looks like. It's a tar GZ of the server. Uh, but yeah, it looks I, like a lot of the front end is written in PHP. I bet I bet if, we, if this doesn't go open, you won't even really hear about it after this. But if they do open it up, it, uh, we could see. I mean, if people could go through and audit it, I would trust this probably more than I would if it's open source than BitTorrent Sync. Skeptical, Eric is skeptical. That's good. That's healthy. It's good to be skeptical. Hey, something else you should be skeptical. I'm going to show you a product that is a, really a bit of a flashback. Uh, we had a good pre-show discussion about really, really old file systems, HFS. <clears throat> and uh, <coughs> the machine I'm going to show you runs the same file system that your fancy Mac Pro or MacBook runs, HFS+. Plus. So just keep that in mind when we watch this. And also, what a departure this is from any Apple product they would make today. They would never make something like this. And I'll give you one hint as to why. It's just one word, docking station. So that will wrap it up right there for today. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow, Wednesday, at uh, jblive.tv, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And uh, don't forget about our Patreon page over at patreon.com slash today. I'll be conferring with our top-level patrons very soon on a topic of utmost relevance to this show. You can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash today. This is a pledge system where you can invest and contribute to our network on a monthly basis. I've got a recommended amount of $3. It can be more or less, whatever you're comfortable with, as well as some fixed pledge slots. And we just sent out a batch of swag to our Swag Club members. So go get in those uh, top levels there if you'd like. Either one of the top two slots. I'll be uh, consulting with that group for some show changes, potential ideas soon. So if you'd like to get input on those kinds of things, be part of an advisory panel of sorts, you can do that. But patreon.com slash today. Yes, it's a Tech Talk Today page. That's because we celebrate the, the crowdfunding of our network via this show. Because I'm so appreciative of it. I want to contribute something back to you. That's this show. But you can when you when you pledge there, everything that's raised there goes right back into the network. And that's what that money, every show benefits from that. And it's that's because it's oftentimes it's like things for the studio itself and a piece of equipment. Or it could be something as silly as an air conditioner. It could be something as handy as a new microphone. I mean, it, it, it or, or a service. I mean, it really, it, it crosses the entire business categories that as a whole, every show depends upon to make them possible. So patreon.com slash today, you can help invest in the infrastructure of the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, because I know you're not going to be buying one of these Mac, or it's not even called one of these PowerBook Duos. I'm about to show you. So thank you for joining me, everybody. I'll leave you with a little slice, a little blast from the past, if you will. I said, if you will. I said, go. There it goes. <laughs> it can talk to computers. It can talk to fax machines. It can talk. It fits in your briefcase. It fits in your business. It fits in your life. But the remarkable thing isn't just what it can do. It's what it can become. Introducing PowerBook Duo from Apple.